Hello everyone, I'm having a conversation with Transcend Liberalism, a relatively young channel that's popped up um, relatively quickly. Um, and I just want to point out to ever, or let everyone know, in the description, everything we reference will be there. There'll be timestamps with everything we say. So if you want to look right now in the description section, you'll find like a timestamp for what I'm saying right now. It'll have a link to Transcend Liberalism's, Liberalism's channel. If you want to click on that, hit the subscribe button. And while you're, while you're there, do the same thing for me under this video. But yeah, she's already hit 100 subscribers, and we're going to have a conversation about her channel, about her um, her trip to MythCon a little bit there, but she'll have more on that later on on her own channel, another reason to subscribe, and really her ideological journey. So first, Christina, how are you doing? I'm doing good, and listening to you try to pronounce my channel has just made me realize how much of a tongue twister transcend liberalism is. When, when I start talking, I'll, I'll butcher about 20% of the things I say, so... Oh, that's all right. I'll do the same thing. <laughs> all right. So first, good channel. You've put out a lot of stuff in the last few days, but there's been a sudden drop, and you haven't posted anything in about a week, and I'm interested to know why that is. Well, let's see. I posted a very uh, spicy meme video, which I had to put on BitChute because YouTube has... Uh, basically banned me for uploading for two weeks because I uploaded this video and what I called it was uh, GTA, EU, the bus of peace and it was just basically a little bit of gameplay video of watching a bus run up on the sidewalk and running over people. Which is funny because like half of the videos on like YouTube with GTA because I got flagged for violent material and it's basically the same stuff but I, you know I guess mine was different. Yeah, that's in and you actually they took it down and didn't you upload like a a cleaner version? Yes, I did, and that got taken down a day later, and that's that's what resulted in my ban. That's it's, that's quite an accomplishment, honestly. I I haven't I have yet to get banned, <laughs> and I'm quite surprised. But uh, no, that to me that's a good sign. Like if if someone's channel is getting banned, it's like okay, I want to see what they have to say. <laughs> yeah, it means people are already sitting there stalking my channel, waiting for me for just to do the wrong thing and. I didn't think I did the wrong thing. I made a joke and I made it known that it was a joke and yeah, I still got basically screwed over by it. And that's something that I don't know if the automatic filters can pick that up or if someone actually had to report that. Well, I actually um, put it up for review and I have yet to hear back from YouTube and I'm probably not going to hear back from YouTube anytime soon. I don't know what else to add to that. I mean, it's been two weeks. My ban is almost my ban. My, my ban will be up on Saturday. So, like, even if they did like hit the review on Sunday, it's not going to matter anyway because I can start uploading then anyway. I guess the most important thing is just to remove that strike from my channel because I'm going to have to be a good girl for the next three months. Otherwise, my channel will be completely removed. There was one, or I saw you did two videos on this guy. Um, this guy from the cable, a guy named Taylor. Um, interesting videos. I really do enjoy them. <laughs> and at the end, you call of the second one, you call for a, a debate challenge. And I wanted to know if you ever heard back about that. Nope, haven't heard back from him at all. Haven't heard any replies. I even contacted him on Twitter. Nothing. So apparently, when he debates conservatives, um, he doesn't actually debate conservatives. That's that does not surprise me in the slightest. Especially at the beginning of the second video, I think it was on capitalism, and he's going on about how like. Like, yeah, when I ask people to defend capitalism, they really can't. And then it's like, like you even mentioned in your video, like, who are you talking to? Because <laughs> I want to know. I want to know who he's debating. Because honestly, if he really is debating somebody, they're, they're, they're idiotic if those are the points they're coming up with. They don't understand capitalism and they shouldn't be debating with someone like that. Honestly, he should be debating with me, somebody who understands economics better than, as I put it in the first video, the straw man in his head. Yeah, and it's it's not even from like lack of trying, or it's not even from it's not even that hard to try to find someone to to debate. Like, it's it's um if if you want to look up like people defending capitalism, just do a quick Google search. You'll find like five hundred different think tanks on it, and all kinds of people putting forth all kinds of books and papers, and all kinds of YouTube videos of just people saying this is why we defend capitalism, and it's things like yeah, I've never heard anyone justify capitalism. It's like oh, that that tells me a lot right off the bat. Yeah, it tells me he's pulling his facts out of his ass. And I thought it was a very well done video. It's just like, yeah, like this, this is what an actual defense is. And of course, we're not going to hear a response because I don't think he's <laughs> equipped to do it. 
No, he, he, I, I can almost guarantee he's not equipped to handle me or debate me at all. Yeah, yeah, I, I would really look forward to hearing from him, but yeah, I don't think we will. <laughs> I think he knows what's going to happen. Oh, hey, maybe maybe one day when my ch- if my channel grows and I get more subscribers, then he might come out of the shadows looking for, you know, ghost clicks and things like that for himself. But at the moment, no, I, I highly doubt that he's going to take me Yeah, on. and even then, like, with 100 subscribers, I mean, that, that as much of a mile, like, that's the first big milestone. But I imagine he's, he's just going to look at the... Um, the, the amount of subscribers would be like, well, it's not really worthwhile for me. But hopefully as you go over time, um, he won't be able to ignore that. I mean, I would look at, you know, the amount of likes I get on my videos. He only averages like three or four. And I'm like, a bunch of my videos are up there in the teens. Yeah. And for like, for a small channel with, with um, how many views you get, like that is a very good ratio. That is a fantastic ratio of likes. Yeah. A couple of my videos, like the like, the like to watch ratio is 10 to 1 i believe on a couple of my videos yeah that's that's a, that's higher that's way above the average to the best of my knowledge and that, yeah that's fantastic um so for those that don't know you are the representative for the liberalist to mythcon for i should say the liberalist society um liberalist.net they chose you as the representative we did a big fundraiser you went to mythcon and I have all kinds of questions. Again, whatever we can't answer here, or whatever we can't answer here, we'll be on your channel later for those that um, are curious. But first, just want to say, like, how was MythCon in general? Oh my god, it was so much fun. I mean, <laughs> meeting so many... I was in my element, meeting so many like-minded people and exchanging ideas on other things. I shouldn't say like-minded people, because there were a lot of people I disagreed with on things, and things I agreed with them. It was It was a really great mixture of ideas. I highly recommend if they have it again, which I'm pretty sure they're going to have it again next year, that everybody goes because this is a fantastic conference, a convention, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, they took a, I think they took a big risk last year where they kind of shifted away, not entirely, but they, they had a shift and started opening up more topics that they talked to or that they talked about at the conference. And it seemed like they were taking a risk of shifting from what on against to including another audience and they weren't really sure if it was going to be bigger and better than ever or if it was um or if it was gonna if they were going to lose their audience and not pick up a new one but it seems like they they were pretty full from the pictures i saw uh yeah they were actually pretty full and the line outside uh stretched almost around the block i actually have a couple interviews that i did with the crowd outside asking them opinions and things like that that's going to be going up on my channel as soon as i can upload and yeah it was yeah it, it was so great that's awesome. And and do you think like, or do you think if, if some, cause I know it started out as like an atheist convention and I mean, if they want to change, that's fine. I, I guess the overall topics is myths, which I think they did pretty, pretty accurately. All this kind of falls under myths. Do you think if someone was just say like, they never heard of MythCon before they looked it up, they heard it was an atheist convention. They showed up um, for that reason. Do you think they'd be disappointed? Do you think it was still like they touched on the atheist stuff or do you think they like they shifted uh-huh. topics? They actually did touch on the atheist stuff. Um, the very first uh, panel was um, atheism with a uh, social justice, I believe. Don't it, it's on it's on the um, Mythicist Milwaukee YouTube page now, so people can watch it. And I sort of feel like an idiot because I misquoted a date when I asked um, Armored Skeptic a question, and <laughs> I told him I was a fan of his channel since 2013. That that was incorrect of me to say. I was just very overcome with a lot of emotions at the time and I wasn't really exactly thinking straight when I asked that first question and I have to correct myself and say it was about the spring of spring of 2014 I started watching him I believe I'm trying to like I remember like one of his videos popped up on my YouTube channel and I started watching and I'm like first it was the voice I'm not gonna lie I think Greg's voice is extremely sexy <laughs> And I started listening to him a while. I became a really big fan because I was an atheist then. It was just, I had no real connection to an outside group. A lot of the people I knew, especially because I'm from way, I'm in a, I live in like a country type area and it's very religious around me. So it's kind of, it was nice to have that connection to another community. Right. No, that makes sense. And that, that I think I found his channel probably a year later i think a year after you i think but no it's it's i actually binged watched his entire channel in like two months after i found him 
But I, I, yeah, I really enjoy his stuff. Oh, yeah, his channel is really good. In fact, oh, God, one of my favorite videos by him was probably the Creation Museum uh, tour with uh, that one crazy blonde lady. Like, that one was just so great. <laughs> eukaryotes. The word you're looking for is eukaryotes. But yeah, his, um, <laughs> when I found his channel, I'm pretty sure I was still, like, at least more religious than I am now back then um when i found his channel and it was like it was stuff i'd never heard before it's at least very interesting to just go through his stuff and read it but yeah um so i know he was there a lot of good people were there and it's like a lot of people are in this same kind of group but they're all like they all agree on maybe two or three major things but other than that like they they diverge pretty pretty large like armor skeptic is probably one of the more left-wing people compared to a lot of the other people there and it's like that that's what we want uh, and, I, and I think that's the Canadian in him because it was so funny <laughs> when he was talking to uh, the dim. He was just like, I, 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 I don't want to sound confrontational. And I'm just thinking to myself, oh, my God, dude, that is that's the most Canadian thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I'll blame the Canadian part <laughs> gladly. <laughs> <laughs> but the, OK, so one of the other things, like one of the big takes from all this is you have people attacking it, saying like, uh, yeah, saying this is like a neo-Nazi convention, which is obviously like only the, the really crazy people say that's true because it's not, it's not even remotely. Yeah, well, we actually had a, a crazy person calling a bomb threat. I can talk about that because that's known. That's all over Twitter and everything. And, oh, that was really fun because it was just like. Um... Do, so we do, do we know anything more than I guess someone just called in a bomb threat and we took the safe procedure and evacuated the building and then came back in and that was it? Well, what basically what happened was. Um... I went out, you know, we were at, we were able to go out for like, you know, cigarettes and things like that and hang out in the front. We just had to get ourselves, you know, wanted every time and go back in. Not a big deal. And then I tried to go out for a cigarette one time and then like, we're not letting anybody out right now. I'm like, until uh, the dinner break. And I thought, well, this is weird. You guys are just letting us out and everything. So I'm like, so I'm thinking to myself, great. I got to wait like another hour and a half, two hours for a cigarette and whatever. I'll just sit here and talk to people in the meantime. And I was having a uh, conversation with someone, and then the next thing I hear was, everybody needs to get out of the building, now, now, ow, ow, now! <laughs> and of course, my ass booked, I didn't know what the fuck was going on. So uh, they weren't even like, they were just like, yeah, everyone out now. <laughs> yeah, and they had the whole block uh, blocked off, there was a fire department, police were lined up there, and I'm like, I saw the bomb sniffing dog come out, I'm like, oh boy, I know what's going on here. Yeah, that, that, honestly, that surprised me. Like, I'm used to, to hearing all these different, like, people calling bomb threats, people full of fire alarms, but I figured with, with, uh, MythCon, like, of all the places that only the really, like, the really, the Steve Shives type people actually go and say this is a racist, like, neo-Nazi convention kind of thing, and yet someone did actually call in a bomb threat. Like, that, that actually surprised me. Which was funny, too, because I think there was a poll going on. I forget, uh, who did it, because I was talking with, uh, one of the promoter guys, like we stopped at a bar, had a drink and we had a, you know, a chat and a conversation while everything was going on. And it was like <laughs> the poll, who called in the bomb threat, a leftist, Antifa, or it was like something like a trolley right winger just looking to for Kex or something. And I'm just like, oh, let's see, I can only imagine because I know, um, I know uh, some black guy had a, a stream on it and I know the authorities over at uh, Milwaukee questioned him so i know that something happened i believe something happened in his super chat or something which is why he got questioned i honestly don't have all the information i haven't real, really able to find much i think it's just the police and mythcon and everything are trying to keep it under wraps right and which I, isn't necessarily a bad thing yeah i can't blame them for that at all but then okay so one more thing about mythcon which is the whole like the whole purpose of this was to be to to create a dialogue, was to have debates and discussions because there's it's not too often that both sides are really like okay, let's sit down and have a conversation. Especially at MythCon, where I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm imagining that the majority of the audience was at least on the side of like the skeptics people, like the 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 right wing side. And I, I okay, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I appreciate that the people came there to like the other side came there to really have a discussion and. Would you say that the overall it was productive? Like, do you think that the people were actually talking about the issues? Or do you think people talked past each other? How do you think that went? Um, it was really like a mix. A lot of times there were some of the more uh, left wing speakers talking and they were really just parroting debunked points. And there would be times when um, 
they'd be talking past each other. And then, you know, we came onto the Sargon panel and <laughs> that 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 was a shit show, to say the least. I, I heard it was a bit better than last year is what I heard. Yeah, yeah. Um, the uh, Carl's uh, opponent didn't walk up and get out. So that's that's a plus. Yeah, that's when we when people walk out right at the right at the end of the panel. It's like, yeah, that's. That doesn't, that's not a sign of a good call. So that's good that everyone actually stayed. And in fact, um, bringing that up too, um, having people representing their side, I actually went up to Christiosity and Music Band Mike and those guys, and, you know, I basically thanked them for coming. I told them, you know, even though uh, I disagree with you on a lot of things, I just wanted to thank you for coming out and thank you for speaking and thank you for speaking for your half. Because just because we disagree doesn't mean that we can't be civil and have these discussions. And I think that's a big problem of what's going on with politics right now, and is that it's become a dichotomy where you're either left-wing or you're right-wing, and if you're right-wing, well, screw the left-wing opinions, and if you're left-wing, well, screw the right-wing opinions. Yeah, it's it, that's one of the honest like that's one of the reasons like I got originally involved in the liberalist group because I mean I'm I'm more libertarian generally and it's like I'm surrounded by libertarian people for the most part in um in discussions and that which is fine like I like having there's still a wide variety of things to talk about there but at least when I joined the, like the liberalist group it was neat to see like you have a lot of people like you have people as far left as like social democrat which isn't far left but still um considerably far left farther left than you would find in like a libertarian group but it was nice to see all these different people like we're at least we're all having a conversation and at times it'll get like a little tense because we'll talk about really things we're really passionate about but overall like it's just kind of a chill people just talking about stuff they disagree with and it's like that's how you learn yeah it's because you can you can still be a social democrat and still hold the basic liberalist values which i enjoy because you can have a wide range like we have you know our our mormon conservative you know the carnal conservative i i disagree with him on a couple things but we're still friendly we still talk I disagree with our Canadian friend Liam on a couple things, but we're friends and we talk constantly. So that's why I really like this group because it is a diverse group that shares multiple opinions. And that's just, it's, it's fantastic to have that because I hate living in an echo chamber. It doesn't create new and better ideas when you just surround yourself with everybody parodying the same idea. Yeah, like it's like you just said to mention those few people like they're so wide ranged and again plenty of things I disagree with them on but it's like in there's nothing I there's nothing they endorse that to me is so radical that it's like wow this is a terrible person it's just like oh they have a different opinion okay that's fine like that's fine by me and so many of these conversations have actually gone like way above my head that it's like okay I have to really step back and do some more research before I even think about engaging in this because wow. I've I've actually been caught myself in a reevaluation moment like oh I need to I need to reevaluate this I need to step back and consider what this person is saying and well does it conflate with my views or does it can I make it work with my views and stuff like that and well is this idea right with that and like that's why I really enjoy this group yeah, and I think it actually was when I found Sargon's channel to begin with which led me to the liberalist group it was his channel to begin with that really made me step back from like not even step back because I didn't change too many of what I believed on things, but I at least um listening to his channel I was like, Okay, it's it's not so immediately one sided. Like there's a lot of things that are way more complicated that I have to do way more research on before I, I say yes, this position is accurate and it's like that's that's what's the most important, really. Exactly. God, when did I find caught Sargon's channel? Um I actually think I found it through uh, Armored Skeptic and uh, The Bible Reloaded. I, I think it was The Bible Reloaded, actually. I watched one of the Chick Tracks with him. And, yeah, I think that's what drew me to him. Was He was another one, he was another one of those with those voices that you can just sit there and listen to. Like, I swear, like, he, Sargon of Akkad could do, like, a David Attenborough-type documentary, and I would just be like, uh-huh, this is amazing. Oh yeah, he, he. There's not too many people that would prefer to to narrate a, like a documentary or something other than him. I I go maybe like a John Lithgow, but I could listen to Sargon Ooh, yeah. <laughs> just for hours and hours doing some kind of narration or audiobook reading like he has on his I think his fourth channel. Yes, yes, that one. 
Uh, so it's, it's the Thinkery, Sargon of Akkad, Sargon live streams, and yeah, that one. And that, yeah, that's if you don't include the, the since deceased new me media channel that got taken down by Destiny. <laughs> yeah, rest in peace, that channel. All right, and then so that that's I think we covered MythCon pretty well. Again, any anything there there's going to be all kinds of other things on your channel later on when you can actually upload and the ban is over. Um and when MythCon starts putting out videos and that. So again, link in the description to her channel to follow that. And the last thing I really wanted to cover then was just like I I like to ask about everyone your your ideological journey from start to finish like what did you believe when you were young, before you really were interested in much of the, like, before you were really engaged in any of this stuff, what was your basic beliefs, and who did you find, who influenced you, and wh where are you now? Well, let's see. I'll probably start from when I was uh, pre-transition, living as a man, things like that. Uh, I was actually in a death metal band, you know, toured around for a while. I was a ship poster then, like, I... For those who have been on the internet for a while, I used to frequent the site uh, BOG, uh, lowercase b0g.org, which was basically, like I think, like the precursor to 4chan, because I could swear to God I still hear some of the language from the comments on that site used in 4chan, so I swear there's some boggers on 4chan. But um, I used to have a, a photo bucket filled with like some really offensive pictures until they basically redid their whole servers and everything. I'm kind of sad because I wanted to pull some of them <laughs> But um, when I started my transition, because basically if I didn't uh, transition, I would probably be dead right now from how I was drinking, just trying to suppress everything. And when I started transitioning, I was sort of pushed into leftism. Like, you know, that this is what we do and this is like what we need and things like that. And I was like, oh, wow, like, hmm, these things, could these things be true? Could these things have been going on? And like you start to really kind of listen to them like, okay, well, you know, you had this experience and you had this experience. So maybe these things aren't all bad. And God, probably like 20, it had to have been the summer of 2015 when, um, Armored Skeptic put out his, I don't know what the hell that was. I don't know if you guys heard a rumble. I'm sorry about that. Um, when Armored Skeptic put out his, uh, Steve Shy's video on feminism, <laughs> I remember thinking to myself, I remember seeing that video in bed going, oh God, Greg, please no, please don't do this. Please don't take on feminism. Because I was, or I guess I could have considered myself a feminist at one point because I didn't really understand what egalitarianism was. And everybody just kept telling me, oh yeah, feminism is about equality. So I just, I kind of accepted it because, you know, everybody kept saying that. And that's sort of what happens like in an echo chamber is everybody just keeps parroting the same idea. And so people just come to accept it without really researching it or learning for, them, learning for themselves. So I finally actually did get around to watching the video and my, my jaw dropped. Like, I was like, oh my God, this difference of opinions and they're actually halfway decent ones criticizing this idea. And I, because I was involved with like feminism and things like that, I actually saw some of the things that Greg was pointing out that actually happened. And I'm just like, okay, so what's going to happen if I start calling this stuff out? And I had some really far leftist friends on my page at the time. And I remember like one of them like was a legit, like straight up anarcho communist. And I brought, you know, like these things up to him when on one of his posts and he's just like, what are you doing questioning me? And like, well, you're putting out a stupid idea and it's been debunked. And he's like, no, 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 no. And then we started like button heads and things like that. Like it, it's been a while. So I can't really remember the conversation. And he blocked me because I pointed out one of a really stupid idea of his. But then I think it was Antifa in 2016 or 2017. I think it had to have been about 2017 that finally, no, was it? When was the uh, Richmondville March again? Was that 2016 or 2017? Now it had to have been 2017. But I know Antifa was around prior to that, but it was that march right there that finally pushed me over the edge to say to myself, I can no longer associate with these people because I've never advocated for violence as a reaction to thought. Yeah, that was with Antifa. Like there, there I'm, I'm tend to be very, very like humble in my ideas of like, like thinking, okay, I could, I'm probably wrong on what I'm about to say, but I'll put it out there and I'll see what people say. 
and I could be wrong, but when it comes to like Antifa, <laughs> I I would never punch I would never punch somebody for their idea. I would challenge it with more, with a better idea or a better thought. Like that that's what I would do, and that's what everybody should be doing. Yeah, like once it, like when Antifa starts doing it, when someone starts shutting down speakers, it's like okay, I don't know what you believe, but you're wrong. <laughs> like exactly because it, it it just basically means that their ideas cannot be challenged. Yeah, and like you said, that like once you challenge the guy on his views, it's just like, wait, what are you doing? And like he's just like, you're not supposed to go against me. And it's yeah. that's generally how it is for the most part. It's like you never really hear anything different. And then once you do, it's like I've never heard these ideas before. I'm like, wow, you have to rethink everything. Yeah, and that's that's basically what happened because I've always been a nonviolent person. I don't like confrontation. I don't like getting into fights, but I will defend myself if I have to and things like that. And just. It, it, it blows my mind that people think it's okay to assault people because they disagree with them. Like, there's the one video on my channel where the Bernie Sanders guy got knocked over the head with, like, a nightstick or a, bat, a small bat or something and put open a, a huge open gash in the back of his head, gave him a concussion and everything. And I'm like, all because he was carrying an American flag. I'm like, and the left wants to promote these people as the reasonable um saviors of democracy i'm like are you fucking kidding me yeah it's just like like the, the, uh, there are certain ideas like there are certain ideas that i will just say absolutely no one and one of those is is beating up other people because we disagree it's like you know what like i can't imagine like actually it, i don't know what's better honestly because either they don't know the arguments and they don't know what the other side actually thinks they didn't do the research they're just like okay these people are probably evil and that's good enough for them to attack them. These people are probably actual Nazis, which is, I think, is probably the case. They're just like, I'm not even going to see what they think what they say. It's probably evil when they attack them. Or they actually are aware of their views, and they think they're that bad anyway and deserve being beat up. So <laughs> I honestly don't know what's worse. It's, it, it, it's almost like a dogmatic religion, almost. It's like how you said it. Like, I believe this person is bad, so therefore I am justified in my actions. There's, there's no evidence to, for you to say, like, even even when somebody's, like, a fucking Nazi, like, I'm not going to sit there and punch Nazi in the face. I'm going to call them a fucking retard. I'm going to call them a fucking idiot. I'm going to laugh in their face, but I'm sure as hell not going to punch them. Yeah, it's, a, and when you think about it, like, who's the most popular white nationalist, like, alt-right person out there? Well, I, I believe it's Richard Spencer, and most people I know, including myself, I have not the slightest clue who he was until he got punched <laughs> and then he was all over the news yeah. and when he got punched it was like okay i don't know what this guy is saying but it's probably right because he's getting punched i looked into it and i'm like okay he's not right but <laughs> or he's not correct um what he's saying but i wouldn't have heard about him originally if he hadn't been punched to begin with yeah antifa has been the best promoters of nazism i have ever met yeah and they're putting it like i, I follow all kinds of antifa pages and they're just like or uh, Richard Spencer, I guess, has been going on fewer tours and started canceling tours because he just can't get an audience. And everyone's saying, like, all the Antifa pages are like, yeah, we did it. It's because we were violent. It's because we terrified people into to, to, um, to not going to his speeches. And, like, I'm pretty sure it's the opposite. Like, I'm pretty sure even with your endorsement of Richard Spencer by attacking him, like, the, the labeling him an enemy, I'm pretty sure even then, like, it's the fact that no one just is interested in him enough to actually go to his speeches. Like, I don't think it's because you were scaring people. Yeah, it's because his ideas don't involve, um, evolve or change. He's always talking about the same white ethno state and the same ideas. And they're, they're just boring. They're, they're stupid. They've been, they can be easily debunked and just ethno states don't work in a democracy, in a free democracy. They, they just don't because it's, it, basically, it's the authoritarian right versus the authoritarian left. They both want power. I know I'm kind of tangenting there. <laughs> Wait, no, that is like that is a valid point. It's like you have you have the authoritarian who left who are like we're playing the game of we want power and that, and then you have the authoritarian right who are like, well, if you're fighting for power, then we'll fight for power on the opposite side. And then you tend to have the more groups like like a, you and I are part of, which tends to be that game is stupid. We're not getting involved. <laughs> Like, we're just going to say, yeah. we're not even going to, we're just going to laugh at you. <laughs> Pretty much. We're going to laugh at you and come up with better ideas. That That's, that's exactly what we do. We think you're, we think you're idiots and you, like, your thoughts are just stupid. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the best thing I can say. It's just. Yeah, there, there are plenty of people that I've already gone through and, like, debunked everything deeply in depth. It's like, we don't have to go over that again. It's pretty, pretty, um clear there but actually like 
the way they put it, I think like they, they everyone always tends to lump us in with like the far right, or at least the people on the left tend to lump us in with the far right. And there's actually a friend of mine that wrote like I'll see if I can link to it. I think I forget where he posted it, but I'll find it and link to it in the description um, under this with a timestamp to this moment. Um, he wrote like he came up with his own idea of a political spectrum, and instead of having like the four quadrants, he had a triangle. I, I think he called it the isosceles triangle of ideology, was what he called it. And basically what he had was, I mean, so isosceles triangle, two of those sides are closer to each other than the third side. Mm -hmm. And he had three corners he had, or obviously, um, he had like, I forget what they were exactly, I'll link to the description. But the ideologies were essentially, like the anarcho-communists were in one corner, the far right was in another corner, and then like the libertarian like type groups, the classical liberals, were in a third corner. And... That actually, I think that puts it the best because you have the far left and the far right, how they're kind of opposites in a sense that they're both authoritarian, but they're competing for like opposite interests. So they, they collide with each other. And then you kind of have the third group, which is just saying like, no, we disagree with both of you on, on, the, on the fight you're having, on the game you're playing. And that, that's actually pretty good because, yeah, the authoritarian left, they're basically the same thing. They just have different views on what they want. But their their end goal is exactly the same thing. Yeah, it's like when you when you're a, when you're an authoritarian, you're going to fight two groups of people. You're going to fight the people that are against authoritarianism, and you're going to fight the group of people that are vying for the power that you want. <laughs> and that's that's essentially how it works in the in the spectrum. And then our group is just like, look, we wanna we wanna vote for the people who are best qualified to sit there and lead a nation. It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter what their religion are. It doesn't matter what their skin color are. It doesn't matter what their personality type is. We just want the best ideas. Yeah, and that's that's the only way to do that is to start talking to people. It's like, I don't think anybody can possibly sit down and become an expert on everything that encompasses politics. Even if they just did nothing but read and listen and learn stuff for decades and decades, I don't think you could become an expert in that so it's like hey we just have to start throwing around ideas start throwing around um having debates and stuff and it's like yeah politics politics is a river it's it's <laughs> it's always changing and it's never going to be the same thing twice politics is it's a constantly evolving i guess you could say yeah i'll, I'll just use idea politics is basically just an evolving a constantly evolving idea that's always taking new shapes the problem with authoritarianism is that with Nazism and things like that, it's always going to be rooted into 19, 1930s uh, Hitler ideology. And with communism, it's always going to be rooted into 1800s Marx ideology. It's, those ideas are never going to evolve. Those ideas are never going to change because they're always rooted in a single person. Yeah, they're, it's, yeah, they're just not going to work like we've been, and, uh, we've been through them. Oh, oh come on, boy. It's, real communism has never been tried. Yeah. <laughs> so, which, I mean, it's like, when they say that, it's like they're not wrong because they never achieved real communism. It's just that they tried it and it didn't work. So we can just safely say it's not going to like we're not going to get there. Like it's not a thing that can happen. Like if, if you want to say it's never been or actually, yeah, they I, I misphrased that. They are wrong in that real communism has never been tried. It's just that they're right in that real communism has never happened. It's been tried tons of times, and all we have is dead bodies. And it's like, okay, we can put yeah. this, we can put it's this just in the closet. Never like, succeeded the way yeah. they wanted it to. Yeah, it's like, like, it's it's not it's not whether it it's not whether we achieved the society and how it worked. It's whether you tried to achieve it. And if you didn't get it, then it's like, okay, it didn't work. Time to move on. No, not to them. It's oh, you know, it didn't work. Well, we gotta try it again. Yeah, and they always find some way to excuse it because, like, again, every time I follow the Antifa pages, and it's like Venezuela didn't work, capitalism. <laughs> Let's blame capitalism. Oh my God, that that brings up the cable. He always like, <laughs> and when capitalists bring up Venezuela, I'm like, well, yeah. How how about you actually talk about Uruguay, which was once a socialist nation prior to two thousand three, and when they ditched the whole socialist uh, economy and switched to capitalism. Their economy has grown fourfold in 15 years. That is absolutely amazing, economically speaking, to have your country grow fourfold. It is just... Congratulations, Uruguay. I'm actually proud of you. Yeah, that, that's like... That, that's just astounding. And that's incredible. Like, it's a great thing to celebrate. It's it's wonderful. And someone actually brought up... I'm trying to think of... Oh, um, 
back in what was it back in 2013 if you look at a bunch of articles from 2013 you have all these people that are like yes socialism or um venezuela is embracing socialism we're gonna look back at them i'm gonna butcher the exact quote but to paraphrase they were essentially saying in 10 years we're gonna look at venezuela and say wow this is a great country they're gonna lead they're gonna be the leading country in south america and we're gonna have to start um using them as a as a map of how to go about things it's like so much for that <laughs> it lasted two years well they, they they are leading in things like inflation and starvation so i mean they're, they're not technically wrong there <laughs> i mean just just remember if you it, to, to solve inflation we can follow venezuela and just take a bunch of zeros off your dollar bill or off your your boulevards yeah just, yeah, just cr- create whole new money <laughs> yeah here, here's new money and then that inflates like a thousand percent overnight and actually, Venezuela is um, apparently like they're they're act the the one industry they're actually doing really well in is cryptocurrency. Like all the cryptocurrencies are apparently doing very well in Venezuela because it's like that's the best money out there because all the the bolivars are worth nothing. Oh well, yeah, I mean, because people are going to seek something that has value. Because what it's, it's something like what a cup of coffee is a million bolivars and like a million a million bolivars is the minimum wage per month in venezuela so imagine being able to only afford one cup of coffee a month meanwhile i can buy like a hundred cups of coffee with my wages per day yeah and people say it's due to like lack of um like the argument's always like it's due to a lack of wealth like there's no countries are poor because there there isn't enough um like there isn't enough value in the in the society it's like venezuela has so much oil they have so they have so many great resources they have they used to have all this wealth what not three years ago four years ago and it's like it's not the lack of wealth it's not like you can just pump money into the society and everything will go well it's it's the system well yeah it's because uh chavez and maduro what they did was they took the oil profits that they made and they basically redistributed to the people they didn't make investments in their infrastructure and now they're I think they're working at some, I, I forget what the uh, the capacity is that they're working with, but it's a fraction of what it used to be. And that's one of the reasons why their country is just basically going broke. Like their, their budget is, as I pointed out in one of my videos, is equivalent to the average salary of a registered nurse in the U.S. It's like $64,000 a year. But in Venezuela, something like 44 trillion bolivars or something. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure they're even importing oil now. Like they have a ton of oil. Um, just now, like they used to. I'm pretty sure like a lot of their wealth came from oil. Was just mining and selling the oil, or drilling for the oil and selling it. Now they have to import it because they can't even like produce it efficiently enough. Yeah, prior to 2003, they they were the richest South American nation because of their oil exports and everything. They were they were competing with OPEC. In fact, I, I think it was. I don't. I don't want to say it was until Chavez that uh venezuela joined opec i'm not quite sure on that so don't quote me on that but they they basically they were i remember getty stations all over the place in the u.s which was venezuela's uh oil company and then it was like when i graduated high school they all just disappeared and i'm like well what happened here because i didn't really understand what was going on at the time i was stupid teenager wanted to play heavy metal and do my own thing and I was like, well, that's that's one gas station that I used to use that's gone now, so I guess I'll use, like, Hesser Mobile. <clears throat> and I do remember reading, like, I, I read a lot of The Economist back in 2015, which I think covered it rather well. And I guess during that time, basically, we were all producing a ton of oil. Like, there was so much oil, I'm all meaning everyone in the world, was producing so much oil that they were actually, um, like, companies were taking oil and paying to store it and just put it away because... It was all down to like who could who would be the first one out basically would be the loser. They were selling oil at a loss because they knew the first once once someone goes out of business and stops producing oil, then the re, like the price will rise again to where people are making the companies are making profit again. But until then, it was just like the first one out is the loser, and pretty much that was Venezuela. Like they could not produce it well enough. They didn't have enough value. They like they didn't run their um, oil facilities well enough to be able to compete with the rest of the world. So it's like they dropped out because they couldn't do it. Yeah, I remember that time, like, I think it was, it, it had to have been like 2000, because that's when I started driving, that I, re- I remember paying something like 89 cents a gallon for gas, because that was like, that was pretty much the height of the, the moment you were talking about there, where there was just so much oil around that just prices plummeted. And then like three years later, I'm paying a buck 70, and I'm sitting there going, what the hell is going on here? 
it's, it's, it's it, Venezuela is just it. It's an embarrassment, and there's there's so many videos out there on why it is like why you can't blame it on capitalism and stuff like that. There there are tons of calls too from from um, Venezuelans. I've heard like people calling into various shows from Venezuela saying like, yeah, this is what happened, and this is socialism, and this is all Maduro's fault, basically. Yeah, and I love the one one of the biggest defenses you'll hear about uh, Venezuela is, oh well, it's U.S. imperialism. Nah, nah, nah. It's because we put embargoes on them. And it's like, well, yeah, you stole something that wasn't yours. What the hell do you think was going to happen? And if socialism could actually work, which is basically a self-funded, everybody shares the resources type thing, then it should be able to function without assistance from the outside world. And it can't. So, again, like, even the people who say, like, you're, you know, like I said, the US, U.S. imperialism thing, like, all you got to do is just sit there and ask them, well, why can't communism be self-contained? Why doesn't it work self-contained? And you'll never get an answer from them. They'll always find some they'll always find something else for them to blame for whatever reason of why socialism and communism fails. And actually I think it was I think it was Marx who even said that um uh, I'll have to fact check this and post a, a, some kind of source in the description to this. Pretty sure it was Marx that said that communism um can't actually work unless it's global. Like you have to pretty much conquer the entire world <laughs> for it to work, which is a pretty high standard of um rules but i would actually argue it's the exact opposite like if anything if there's one place a communist society could work it's in a super super small community where everybody knows everyone and can a and can at least levy some sort of social pressure on people that cheat because they know like they know people well enough to cheat but even then like i think sargon did videos on this on like a few self-contained communist societies and basically like it's horrible like pe like it's a horrible place to live <laughs> One of them, one of them is actually Slab Town. I don't know if Sargon covered Slab Town. Yes, or not, it was but, um, on his Thinkery channel. Yeah, it's in California, yeah, yeah. right? And yeah, it's in California. And basically, you can watch the uh, the Vice documentary on it because that's that's where I learned about it. And somebody had their had their home burned down, and people were just like, "Well, you know, we we don't know. We can't do anything." I'm like, "That that's yeah, that's great. I want to live in that kind of society." I want to live in a society where somebody can burn down my house and people are just going to shrug their fucking shoulders. They even brought up, like, for one, it was an abandoned, I think it was an abandoned military base or something like that, that it started out as some kind of abandoned area. And they, so for one, they didn't even build their own town. They just took an abandoned town for their own. And apparently a lot of their, like, there are a lot of them are on food stamps and all kinds of things. So to get wealth to survive, they go to the nearby town, like, or to the nearest city, which I think is like an hour away or something. They go there, they get their supplies from a capital, like from, from some kind of business, and then they bring it back. And it's like, this, mm -hmm. <laughs> this is, this is, you're, it's surviving only because it's relying on the nearby capitalist cities, and it's still awful. Yeah, and that's, to your point, like, with Marx saying that communism can only survive if it's global, well then, even then, it's still self-contained. So if it can't work on the small scale, if it can't work on the country scale, how the hell is it going to work on the global scale? Yeah, everything, like, all these different ideologies, they could, if, if they're ever going to work anywhere, it's going to be in a super small society. And, I mean, if you can't even get it to work there, it's like, you're going to have a lot, you're going to have a bad time yeah. when you start Meanwhile, scaling it. Meanwhile, capitalism has worked in the super small. In fact, I actually sort of uh, promote local economies and things like that. I like to... Cause uh, I I'm looking for like videographers and things like that, and I ask my friends like I'm looking for someone local and I'm looking for a small business because I want to support my local economy. And capitalism works on a small scale. Capitalism works on a country scale. Capitalism works on a global scale. So there you have your three check marks of an economic system that works versus zero out of three check marks for an economic system that doesn't. Yeah, and it's like even when people bring up criticisms of capitalism, it's like yes, there is somewhere someone somewhere in a capitalist society that might actually like not do very well like there are people out there that aren't aren't doing that well and it's like in a capitalist society it's like okay but compared to what <laughs> like give me your other society that's so-called work that's supposedly working better it's like you can't compare it to oh no i'm i'm <laughs> i'm tweeting i'm poor for my 800 dollars iphone with wi-fi hmm yeah capitalism is so horrible but I, I, I sort of make the comparisons like this. No system is going to be perfect. I can bring up um, Canada's social medicine versus uh, American's capital medicine, for example. The issue with America's medical system is you are going to have people priced out of the system because 
in our system, we try to get people in to be seen as fast as possible. Like, I have a, um, for the people who saw me at MythCon, they saw me with this giant ski boot on. I have a heel spur in my foot right now that I'm having surgery on in November that has basically shredded my plantar tendon and things like that. I was able to see my general practitioner and a specialist podiatrist in the same day within hours of each other. In Canada, that probably would have taken weeks for that to happen. And so that's that's the drawback with the Canadian medicine is, well, yeah, you're going to have everybody's going to be covered, but you're going to have extremely long wait times for certain things. Like, obviously, emergency medicine, there, there isn't going to be wait times for that because that's, that's obvious. There's just like you're not going to have to show insurance when you go into the emergency room if you come in like through an ambulance with an emergency. They're just going to work on you. And both systems are like that. And even if, um, even like people talk about like a, like a pure capitalist society where say like you didn't have any laws, um, you didn't have the, like a ton of different healthcare regulations. It's like, imagine running a hospital and then imagine like, say it was perfectly legal and perfectly like you wouldn't be in trouble for say someone shows up to the hospital, they're like bleeding out or something. And the hospital's like, you don't have insurance, go away. <laughs> like imagine do, like no hospital would do that because they'd be out of business the next day like that'd be oh, all over absolutely. the news that'd be all over the media like everyone would say look at this hospital if you're in trouble don't go there because you might not be taken care of and it's like so much for that hospital like it's better for the hospital to say okay we'll risk it we'll have to lose some money from certain people that we learned later on couldn't pay but it's like that's even if you just concern even if you only think about their own like self-interest of profit it's still in their best interest to, to cover everyone pretty much if they're coming into the hospital and in need of like emergency, emergency care. Care, yeah. That's because basically um, the court of public opinion rules over capitalism. People vote with their wallets. If people don't like something, they're not going to go there. Like other, there's plenty of restaurants that I've had terrible service at. The food has been crap and I have never returned. And I think it was like one or two of them that was in uh, one of my local areas has recently closed because I basically told my friends, like, look, the service is shit. The food sucks. Don't go there. Here's a better place for you to go where you're going to get great service and you're going to get decent food at a decent price. Yeah, and that's 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 how the system works right there. It's like all you need to do is upset one person that has a few friends and they, they'll tell five, six people at least those people won't go there anymore. And even if someone, like, of those five or six friends, if someone asks them, like, hey, what do you think of this place? They'll say, well, I heard it was bad. Now there's another person that might not go there. So you you don't want to, you want to upset as few people as possible. The only people you can really afford to upset are the ones that aren't going to be convinced otherwise, that are asking for unreasonable things. It's like, you want to make people happy. And I, ac I actually work in a small hospital. And, like, the amount of waste from certain regulations like no wonder the healthcare system's so expensive here yeah I i'm a nurse <laughs> i i oh, you know are. i didn't know that you were a nurse okay yeah I, I i know exactly the regulations and how everything works in the hospitals and how much waste goes into it i've seen um personal care items like soaps and lotions and things like that get thrown away because um they weren't labeled and i'm just sitting there thinking to myself are, are, are you kidding me it's not like the product isn't good because the person's name isn't on it. Yeah, we we've had a few people where like my hospital the, that I'm at small enough that we don't have a um that we we don't have a psych unit, but we'll take in certain people for like like a one on one. Uh, they need like one on one care, like say, um, to medically clear them so they can go to a psych facility. And the amount of waste is insane because certain certain people will need like letters from the the state of Pennsylvania that say like this person's allowed, to, like they are medically cleared to go. And we will keep them there for maybe 10, 11 days past when they are um, medically clear from, like, any logical standpoint. You just look at their labs. The doctor's like, yeah, they're good to go. There's nothing wrong with them. We'll need a letter from the state that takes an extra 10 to 11 days where we're paying, what, I think it's something like $3,000 a day just to stay. I might butcher that, but it's roughly that amount. $3,000 a day to stay in our facility. And it's like we're keeping their, them there for 11 days because we're waiting on the bureaucracy at the – in, in Pennsylvania. It's like it's. And a lot of people just don't realize, like, for every state regulation or federal right, uh, regulation that gets levied on the healthcare industry, you're going to get, like, the, the hospital or the healthcare industry has to hire, like, three more paper pushers. So that's the reason why your health costs are going up. 
is because, you know, the nurses, we, we, we have to attend to the patients. Doctors have to sit there and diagnose. So they have to hire more and more people to sit there and deal with the paperwork that involves the regulations because, oh my God, I have seen some of these regulation packets and they look like novels. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's all out of, and there's actually a chart. I'll see if I can find it and again, put it in the description. There's a chart where it shows over the last few decades in the United States, like the amount of physicians in the healthcare system and the amount of like administrators that just do paperwork and just making sure everything's up to code. Like the amount of physicians has grown at a very slow rate. Like I don't know the exact percentage, but again, I'll include the graph. It's a very slow rate, but it's a slow climb. Um, and you look at the amount of administrators and it's just skyrocketed. And it's like, you're, you're not just paying for your nurse and maybe a nurse's aide if you have one and your doctor and say the basic functioning needs of the hospital. You're paying for that, but you're also paying for the 15 administrators that sit in the office all day and go through the regulations and go through all the paperwork. It's like, that adds up. Yeah, it really does. And it's like, people wonder why they're sitting there paying like, you know, $400 for an IV bag. Well, that's the reason why. It's not because, you know, these hospitals and insurance companies are charging you that much. It's because the hospital has to pay people's salaries because of government regulations. Yeah, and a lot of it's just like it's a lot of the times they actually take a loss on a lot of, um, especially with Medicare. Like Medicare is very. Oh, yeah, it's always a loss on Medicare. Always a loss. Yeah, like you think about it, like every single person that's on Medicare, like. Medicare's job is to make sure they spend as little as possible because they're already spending. I don't know what the exact percentage of the budget is, but it's huge. Well, like their 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 point is to spend as little as possible on the patient. But when it comes to the state, boy, do they stock up their uh, their cronies into the uh, bureau <laughs> bureaucratic offices of Medicare to just sit there and do nothing to keep that. That's where those costs are going. That's where the Medicare costs are going right there because the hospitals and the doctors and the nurses sure as hell aren't getting it. It's going to the people who work for the state. Yeah, and, like, think about that. Every single person that goes to the hospital with Medicare, which, I mean, for me, is, like, most people, honestly, most of the patients I see uh, or, like, that I see at our hospital are are, are on Medicare because, like, they're most of, like, about most of the people that go to the hospital are older and they're usually on Medicare. Most of those are a loss, if not all of them, and that has to be made up somewhere. So it's like, who, who do you think's paying for that? Well, every single person with nor, well, that pays a lot for insurance or everyone, basically everyone that doesn't have Medicare, you have to pay extra to cover all those extra yep. people. Yeah, so we already have socialism forced on us and people don't like it. You can hear people complaining, oh, healthcare costs are going up. Well, what the hell do you think is going to happen when you have a situation like that? It's just, oh, oh, so you want to basically control how much I make and how much you make and how much these doctors make to satisfy and uh pay for your own lifestyle basically and it's well that's that's not how it works yeah it's 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 just like <laughs> like whenever people compare like oh the capitalist system of the united states with the socialist system of canada or something it's like i mean i guess it's technically accurate to call our system capitalist but it is by no means like the government certainly has a very very heavy hand on things and it's just a total waste i see so much waste and it bugs me it's like so many people that like are there constantly and it's like there's no way these people are paying out of pocket for millions of dollars of care well, it's like, especially under um the canada system for example there's a lot of uh uh baby delivery <laughs> maternity uh buildings closing down that specialize in maternity especially in rural areas because it's not in the government's interest to keep them open if they're not making money off of it, you know, the people aren't using them, so they're going to close it because it's a waste of money. And now you've removed that service, and now you have people sitting there driving, like, two, three hours to the big city so that they can deliver their child. Versus, I think there's, like, there's three delivery centers probably within, like, walking distance of me. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, actually, our own hospital actually did shut down our um, our OB unit because we didn't have, like, there weren't enough births to sustain the cost. Though, actually, we closed it down, but there's a hospital, again, a 10-minute drive from here. There's another one, like, a 20-minute drive from here. There's a big city that has a huge hospital about 30 minutes from here. So three hospitals, like, again, in 10-minute intervals, depending on how far you're able to go if you um if you need it. But, like, yeah, there's there's they're all over the place here. <laughs> we shut I, down because there were so many nearby. I only have to drive about 15 minutes into the city and I have the option of two hospitals in that city or I can drive 25 minutes to another city and I'll have the option of like three hospitals there. 
And that's that's one of the things I like because I can sit there and choose my hospital and I can go to the one that I like and has given me the best care and the best services. Whereas in like a socialist system like Canada, well, you got the one hospital and that's it. And it's going to be so, oh, I had this word in my head before, um, institutionalized looking. And that's, that's one of the things I like about how what American hospitals are doing. They're making your patients' rooms and they're making the hospital look more not in not hospital looking not more um institutionalized they're trying to make it look more hotelish and things like that and i appreciate that because it makes people comfortable and being comfortable really helps lower your stress hormones and that's a big key in helping people heal oh yeah it's like environment in a hospital like that plays a surprisingly people don't think about how much of a factor that can actually play in healthcare. like just someone being comfortable where they are Mm -hmm. it absolutely does and, like, I've worked for um, a nursing home that looked completely in, um, institutionalized, and I, I was not happy there. The patients or residents, whatever you want to call them, uh, they were not happy at all. There'd be constantly call bells going off and things like that. And it was just like, I, I felt the need to remove myself from that situation because I was not happy there. And now I'm in another nursing home that looks, oh, it's it's so beautiful, and I have never been happier. See, that's great. That's, that's awesome. And, of course, like you as a nurse went to the best hospital like or not the best hospital sorry the best um um care home like if th that's the way the system works really like if you have people if you have nurses that enjoy caring for their patients like they have good staff they have good um like overall it's just a better place for both the patients and the nurses that's where the nurses will go and they'll leave the places that aren't doing it very exactly. well exactly and the funny thing is I actually get better benefits where I work than I would have been offered at the county run facility that I was um, doing agency work at or I was doing per diem agency work. So I thought that was hysterical. I'm like, huh? So private business is giving me a better deal, better holidays, better pay, better hours and things like that. Whereas the public sector is basically just bending me over and saying, you need to do all this in a certain amount of time. Well, and you, and you know what that means? That means that the the private um, facilities are have a better pick of nurses. That there's going to be a lot more nurses coming there, so they can pick out like these are the ones we want. We can pick the the people at the top because we're providing the best benefits. Whereas you leave the other nurses like they're probably not gonna, the the ones that like you said the county run facilities that don't provide as good services. They're not going to have as good employees. They're not going to have nurses that well. Exactly. Took the words right out of my mouth. All right, so we, we kind of went on a bit of a tangent there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've been talking but, for almost an hour now. Holy crap. Yeah, this is episode, this will be episode six for me, and this will be the sixth episode where we've tangented. <laughs> so this is... Hey, six, six, six. All right, I love it. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> it's a sign but yeah. so it does like i don't mind tangents at all i thought this was a very good conversation but since we're going for about an hour unless you have anything else you want to bring up i think we can we can wrap it up here no that, that sounds good it was really fun talking with you i had a blast thank you for inviting me of course yeah thank you for for um for appearing on my channel and of course everyone if, if you're not already aware again in the description i'll leave a link to um her channel transcend liberalism go ahead and subscribe to that go look through all her videos they're fantastic i've binged watched all of them um it christy <laughs> uh, if, you wanna, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> if you want to if you want to add anything else i don't know like a other social media facebook oh, gab whatever you're on if you want to tell oh, yeah, everyone you where can they follow can me you. on twitter at uh, transcend liberalism or where uh, my handle is at talks and T-A-L-K-S-A-N-N-E. -N -N -E. Or you can find Transcend... Lo See, even I'm screwing it up. It's my freaking channel, and I'm screwing up the damn name. And you can find Transcend Liberalism on Facebook through... Just look up Transcend Liberalism. All right, and you're on BitChute as well, right? A bunch of others. But yeah, we'll have them all in the description so you can find them again. Thank you one more time, Christina, for, um, for this Thank chat. You. And we'll end it right here. Thanks for watching.